piece of software here that we'll let finish up uh, downloading and then we'll, I'll demonstrate what it is I want to demonstrate with it. Um, to review the example that we had, it looks like this. Yes, I did. <laughs> People don't trust that I know what I'm doing today. I don't know. I, I don't know what that what that means. That that phone doesn't work. I had to go across. Oh. That's why I, I stepped across the hall to do that. Uh, this is the example that we had from last time, and the issue uh, was, of course, that with that background image, it, it obscures a lot of the text. Now, notice it doesn't obscure this part of the text because we, we gave a background for that. But for the things that we didn't give a background for, uh, the text could be very hard to read. So there's a number of things that we could do to possibly help with this. And, and let's look at, at a couple of those things. Uh, one of the things that we could do is we could put everything in a container div. It'll sort of wrap around all the content of our page and we'll then be able to um, we'll then be able to um, put the image around our content as opposed to our content just over top it. It'll be obvious what I mean when I show it to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the HTML to put a container div. And you'll see this in a lot of examples and a lot of actual websites. So I'll go and I'll put a div. And sometimes people call the div wrapper or container. I usually say container. And what this will be is this will simply be a container or a way to group all the content on the page. So I put a div around all the content on the page. I'm going to go and save it. Now, what I'm going to do then in my style is I'm going to set the style for that div to have a background. Now, this will be a, th a third kind of selector. We've seen two selectors already. We've seen HTML based selectors such as body, site, block quote, h1. And we've seen a class based selector where I say everything that has a class of Lincoln gets a certain style role. What I can do in addition to that is I can do a style role based on an ID. And the syntax for doing that is putting the pound sign and the name of the ID. And I can say background white. So everything in the container div is going to have a background of white. So it's going to look like, let's go and save this. Well, sort of didn't do exactly what I would want it to. It kind of did if you look really closely. Because if you look really closely, you can see that image is peeking out there. All right. But we're really not getting the effect of the image there. Why? Because divs, like every block tag, by default takes up like almost the entire screen width, 100% of the screen width. So what I can do is I can set the width of that div to make it so that instead of taking up the whole screen, it takes up part of the screen and we can see the image peeking out from behind that. Well, how do we do that? We do that by 
going into the style and saying with you know, something like we can do 400 pixels. I just picked that number off the top of my head. All right, 400 pixels. We'll demonstrate what I want to do. All right. So this is another attribute that we can put on our stuff in CSS, is we can give it a width attribute. So by default, a div, like all block tags, extends the width of the screen. All right. However, we can override that and make it as wide as we want it to be. To review, because I'm not sure I made this 100% clear, this pound sign container relates to the ID of container. So we've seen sort of three syntaxes, three different ways of defining our selectors. One is simply the HTML tag, where you just put in the HTML tag. No dots or anything in front of it. The other is with a dot in front of it, and that corresponds to a class. So when I say dot Lincoln, the things on the page that have a class of Lincoln get that style. The third one that we've seen, the new one today, is an ID. So an ID of container, that gets the style of pound sign container. So the pound sign indicates that we're, we're styling based on a class. The dot, I'm sorry, the pound sign indicates that we're styling based on an ID. The dot indicates that we're styling based on a class. Now what's the difference between a class and an ID? Uh, an ID ought to be unique. That is, there shouldn't be two things on the page with the same ID. All right. Where it's permissible to have, um, you know, two things on the page with the same class. You know, if you think about it in in everyday life, you know, there's only one student that has a particular student ID. You know, there's no other student. Whatever your student ID is, you're the only one that has that. An ID identifies someone specifically or something specifically. All right. A class, however, can describe a group of people. We could talk about a class of students, for example, of CISS majors. Well, there's more than one CISS major. There can be a bunch of CISS majors. And there can be another class of accounting majors. And there can be another class of uh, nursing majors. So when we talk about a class of something, we're talking about a situation where there, there can be many members of that class, many things having the same class. But when we talk about an ID, we're talking about only one thing having that given ID. So now, people had asked earlier, like, how can we make exceptions? You know, if we, if we want everything on a page styled a certain way, but we want something to be styled a little bit different. We have three choices. If the thing that we want styled different is a specific HTML tag, we can use that. If it is a specific HTML tag, but there's maybe several things on the page that we want styled that way. We can define a class. And lastly, um, if there is just one and only one thing that we want styled a certain way, we can do it based on an ID. All right. At any rate, let me go and save this. And we can look at it again. And there we kind of see it, but it's kind of uh, still not really the effect that I want to. All right. What I can do is that would help this out is put maybe put a margin on the page. So I can say something like oops margin fifty pixels. I did not want to do it there. I want to do it on the on down here. I can put a margin of 50 pixels on the container. And just like a margin in Word, that will put a little bit of space between the edge of the window and that particular HTML element. All right. I'm still not convinced we did a great job here. Uh, I think that this is not the best image to use for a background image, but again, we, we've done some things. We'll, we'll, we'll see better examples of this. One thing that we, we might want to do is we might want to center this. All right? How can we center it? 
Well, one thing that you need to remember is I could probably play around with these numbers and center it this way. Okay, that looks pretty well centered, right? Approximately. But what's wrong with that approach of centering by putting in a precise number? Yes. It'll change by device and it'll change as I resize the window. So in other words, if I was working and my window was real small, or if I was viewing a mobile device, or I had a really big screen, or I had a real tiny screen. So we're going to avoid doing things with an absolute number. So I'm going to say margin 0px auto. And we'll explain what that means in a minute here. Now notice as I make it bigger or smaller, it keeps it centered. 0px auto is, if you think about it, there's four margins, right? There's a top margin, there's a uh, right margin, there's a bottom margin, and there's a left margin. When I say 0, px, and then auto, I'm going around like a clock. Now there's only two numbers given, or, or two descriptions given, so we repeat them. So the top margin would be 0, px, the right margin would be automatically determined. That'll make sure it centers it. The bottom is 0, px, and the left is automatically. So the left and the right are automatically, and that has the effect of centering it, and the top and bottom are 0 pixels. Question? The width of the container div. Mm -hmm. Right. And that container div goes around all the content. Alright. Now, there's other things that we can do too. Alright. One of the things that we could do, instead of doing this, is we could uh, fade the image to make it a little bit more like a watermark. Alright? So, I downloaded a piece of software called the GIMP. Now, the GIMP is photo editing software, and the one nice thing about it is it is absolutely free to be used. It's an open source product, and it's free. And you can, anyone in the world on any platform a computer, or at least the main platforms of computer, Macs, PCs, and Linux, can download it and use it for free. And it's an industrial strength photo editor. It's not some rinky-dink piece of software that only has, uh, you know, only has very limited functionality. Um, I encourage students especially um, to look at open source alternatives. Open source software is software that is created by people that like the program. All right? And people work on these products and people share their results for free. There's a, there's a tradition going back in computers of people when they do something cool wanting to show it off and wanting to make it freely available. Um, Steve uh, Wozniak of Apple Computers, he didn't want to sell Apple computers when he first came up with the Apple II. He wanted to just give away the design so anyone could make their own Apple computer that they wanted to. All right? Which is, you know, it was just like unthinkable these days, right? But at least with software, that sort of tradition maintains with open source software. So I'd encourage you anytime you want to download something, a piece of software, to look for an open source alternative because then you can use it for free and it's legal. For example, Microsoft Office costs what? I don't know. It costs hundred bucks, maybe. The best deal you can get right now is eighty bucks for a four-year license for Office 365. Yeah, all right, fair enough. So eighty bucks for a four-year license to Office 365. You know, yeah, you could say, well, that's not that much, but well, yeah, it is kind of a lot. All right, especially when you consider that there is a open-source alternative called Open Office that you can download, and you can do maybe not everything that you can do in Word, but you can do a good portion of the stuff that you can do. Well, the GIMP is an example of open source photo editing. And it is 
at least comparable to Photoshop, which is the big one um, that, uh, that, that many people often buy. And it's not, I, you can't even say it's a fraction of the cost, right? Because it's zero cost as opposed to whatever Photoshop costs, which is a bundle. Do, do you know what Photoshop costs off the top of your head? Or? Uh, uh, Okay, 150 bucks. All right, so I'm going to go and edit this with the GIMP. It's the first time I'm using this, so it might be asking me something, or maybe this is just some initialization. It does take a minute to get this thing fired up, especially since the squirrel um, the computer is slow today. I realize that in talking that I may not have had the computer screen on for the people watching this. So let me, while this starts up, let me go and show what we did. What we did is we created a background image for this and we set a content div so that image sits below the content. The manner in which we did that is I created a content div or a container div that goes around all the content on the page and then I created a style rule for it that says pound sign container, give it a background so that the, 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 the text can be visible over top the image. Then I gave it a width and I set the margin of 0px and auto, which effectively centers that. All right, so now I have the image that I want to edit, open in the GIMP. can be a little intimidating at first, but there's tutorials online and you can work through it. And it's worth a little bit of work to save yourself $150 with Photoshop and all that. What I can do is I can sort of make this look like a uh, a little bit washed out. So that the image is faded a little bit. I can play around with the brightness and contrast here. Until the image is a little bit faded. And we'll Try this. Let's see if there's anything else I want to play with. Yeah, we'll just try that. I'll go and save this. Got to export it if I want to save it as a JPEG. Oh, overwrite, we'll do that. So now if I go and look at this, that image has faded a little bit. All right. Which means that I might not even need the background color. So I might be able to get rid of the background color on this. And now maybe the image and the text won't interfere with each other. All right. I'm not convinced I'm quite there yet, but you get the idea. I'm moving in a direction. And by fading it enough, um, I, can, I can possibly make it where the text can sit on top of the image um, and still be legible. Uh, what, they would, you know, what, what they'd call that in, in Word is like a watermark, all right, where you can see the image kind of on the background, but... Um, you know, it, it's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, obtrusive. The other thing we could do, we put a background here before. The other thing we could do is make the background, we could make the text sitting on something that is transparent. So if we do this, if we go back to where it was before, it looks like this, 
I could make that white instead of a solid white, I could make the white transparent. says I can use this style rule. And I can paste that code in here. Alright, there it did it, but it did it as a gray. Why did it do it as a gray? Because the color is set RGB 000 transparent. 000 as we know is black, so it's making a transparent form of black. Um, what we want is we want a transparent form of white, so we'll do 255, 255, 255. Um, RGB is a different way to specify a color than the hex code. The idea is the same though. You have three numbers and the first represents the red, the second represents the blue, uh, green, and the third represents the blue. So 255, 255, 255 is the equivalent of FF, FF, FF. Alright, so... There we have it, and again, that makes the text a little more readable, all right, and yet the image is still sort of peeking through, all right. I don't like it quite that narrow. I'm going to go and make it, give it maybe a top margin of, give a top margin of 50px auto, and let's make the width. I don't say make it 400 pixels. Let's make the width 60% of the screen. All right. So widths we can express in terms of an absolute number, or we can express them in terms of a percentage. All right. Now the advantage of the percentage is, is that as we resize the window, it'll get narrower and narrower. So if we look at this, all right. And as we make it narrower, well, it actually makes the div more narrow than the picture even. What can I do for that? Well, I can put on a minimum width, maybe 300 pixels. Then it will get smaller and smaller, but it'll never get smaller than 300 pixels. As I go here, at a certain point, the resizing stops. So, how many parameters can you line up? How many parameters you can line up? You can line up as many as, as you need to. So the, the, the only thing you need to do is you need to do the name of the attribute, a colon, the value for the attribute, then a semicolon. All right. Now, I'm just throwing these out here as just new CSS attributes. You know, you can look them up. I, the ones that I use often, I remember off the top of my head, so I don't need to look them up. Something like transparency, as you can see, I did have to look that up because I don't do transparent backgrounds all the time, so that didn't jump out at me, so I had to go in and Google it. So,
yeah. Uh, essentially, there are there are slightly different style rules depending on on the browser. Yeah. That's what that's that's why the word background is listed twice, and that's why these two things are in here. It's just different ways of doing the same thing. I can. That, that I, I guess it's sim I guess it's simpler than that. It, 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 there, there's there's three rules or four rules listed there. The browser will try to do all of them, all right, and it will be able to do some, but it won't be able to do others. And as long as it can do one of them, you're gonna get the transparency, right? As long as it can do one of the four, and and the statement that the person that put this code out there says is this this covers just about all browsers, so. Um, well, we have to put the HTML for the container on that other page. That was the one piece of HTML that we did change here. Most of the HTML we've left intact. If I want to go to Washington and change that, I have to go and add the same container div. You'd give it a different ID, yeah. But again, do you want to make it different than that? Well, I don't know. You probably don't because one of the one of the uh, one very good uh, one important design principle is a notion of consistency, and therefore, if you had something look a lot different, you're you're apt to confuse users. So now these both these pages look the same. Again, with a little bit of effort. One thing I don't like about this image, I'll fix it. Is there's actually a big. Um, There's actually a big white border around it. So I'm going to go and crop this image a little tighter. And save it so I don't get that goofy um, white border around it. All right, that's kind of the effect that I wanted. Instead of having that gap there. Now, the image was actually, the image is actually like this. There was actually a big blank white space at the top and bottom of the image. So when I set it the background, the flag started like part of the way down the page. And I didn't like that. I wanted the flag to start at the very top of the page. So I just went and I cropped that out. So I got rid of the, 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 the white border at the top and bottom just to make it um, start at the top. Now another thing that is very common done, and, and this, this is sort of the way I typically like to use backgrounds. Um, this is an okay of you, a way of do, using backgrounds. I've seen this done to good effect. All right. Whereas if you go to a site, let's pick a site off the top of our head. All right. Here's the home page. If you go to Tumblr, it's a little hard to see that. Let me refresh it because I know it randomizes it. There you might be able to see that uh, better than the other ones. There there's a big background image and the way that that is set up, you know, you can read the text because they made sure all their background images were very dark 
and they made sure the text is very light. All right. So that could be a very attractive way to do a background if done correctly. If done poorly, we're back to where we were when we came into class today where it interferes with the text and the legibility of the page. All right. So having one big giant background, that can be done okay. That can be done well. All right. So I'm not suggesting to avoid it. One small problem with that is you're downloading a big image. In this case, the flag image is 107 KB, which I suppose these days really isn't that big. All right, that, that's a relatively small image. But bigger photographs could be big. It could be, you know, as much as a meg, let's say. And again, while connections of the internet are, are faster than they ever have been, the size of your page is always a consideration. And you don't want to throw extra stuff on the page if it's going to make the download go slower and uh, especially if it doesn't really add any value. So what is often done with, um, with um, pages is um, instead of having a giant picture background, you have a little tile picture that gets repeated over and over and over again. It's a picture that's typically symmetrical, all right? Um, Maybe symmetrical isn't the right word. It, it's, a, it's an image that looks like this. So usually I like yeah, usually geometric shapes. And usually they're done so that they connect to form a pattern. So maybe you have a diamond that looks like this. Well, if you tile these, it's just like tiling, you know, flooring tiles or, or, or wall tiles. If you tile them, that is, if you put a bunch of them next to each other, they're, they're created to sort of line up and form a nice little pattern. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, it's, it's used a lot, the, the idea of tiling. So the advantage of that is you're not downloading a big giant image, you're downloading a little tiny image. And again, since it's not like a photograph of something, you have a little more control over the colors. The problem with a photograph, like if I was going to take a photograph outside and I wanted to use that as a background image for my page. If you look outside, there's a big variance between the lightest and the darkest that you're going to see. So the, the issue is that it's just about always going to interfere with something, right? If I, if I for example, were to take a snapshot out there and made the text white, all right, where the lamps are, if the text fell up against the lamps, it would be hard to read. If I made it uh, black, the text black, where the, where the text lined up with the bushes might be hard to read with the shadows of the bushes. So it's kind of hard to use a photograph as a background image just because of that. Unless you have very tight control over the, over the photograph. Uh, like, for example, the Tumblr one, they made sure that all their photographs were very dark. So, when we go to Tumblr's home page, all right, they, the, again, the very first time they, they make a liar out of me. And again, you can see that's a little bit awkward to read. All right, that's a little more typical because it's dark enough where the white text doesn't interfere with it. All right, where do you get these tiles? Well, there's programs that create these tiles. Um, and there's also uh, online available for them. And again, like any online resource, you should probably give credit to where you got it from. Let's do a search for background tile generator. And what we can do is we can go and we can make a little tile here. All right. Let's see. What do we want to do? Let's pick this one. All right. And there's a couple ways that we can do it. We can make it bigger or smaller. We can change the colors if we want. 
make it a little bit darker, a little bit lighter. Or we can change the shade that we want. We can give it a texture. We can rotate it even. Ooh. And then we're, when we're happy with how it looks, we can go and we can save it. And what it'll do is it'll create a PNG file for us that will get downloaded. I'm going to make a copy of, of the Lincoln page. And I'm going to make a copy of my style sheet file. And I'll use this other background on my pages. put in the comments of the CSS where I got my background from. And I'll go in and download it to the downloads folder. I'll put it on the desktop. Put it in my examples folder. I'm going to give it a simpler name. BG. Now it says it's a PNG image. I have neglected to go on and turn on the extension so I know exactly what the file extension is. So it's bg.png and I can say background of the body bg.png I need to point that to the new style sheet file. Right. The fact is a tile. The fact is a small image. We didn't specify otherwise. If you don't specify otherwise, that image is going to repeat over and over, both vertically and horizontally. You can control that if you don't want it to. But usually with small images like this, you do want it to, to repeat. All right? So. So if you just wanted that in the footer, you would just put footer? Just put in the footer, right. Say background. E exactly. Yeah, so I could put this on any element that I wanted to. All right? Um, for example, if I wanted it on the nav, Let's go here, and what do I want to do? I'm going to put it on the nav, right. Um, I could do this and say nav, and then it'll just be over the nav. Now in this case, that makes those links impossible to read. What can I do to fix that? Well, I can do this. I can say nav a color white. And now we can see those links. 
Now, if you look closely, this is a little bit different kind of selector. All right. In the past, I've simply put HTML tags. I've said H1 or body or whatever. All right. Here, I said nav A. What do you suppose that means? No, these are both HTML tags. These are both HTML tags, right? So, nav A, it means all the links in the navigation section get styled this way. In other words, if I have a link elsewhere, let's see, do I have a link elsewhere? Let's go and put a link on this page. I'll just throw in a link to Google. These are white, these are not. That link is not. Why? Well, because the selector says nav A. That means any link, any A tag, in the navigation section gets this rule. That's why these things are called selectors. They select the things that get the style rules. They point to the things that get the style rules. And therefore, this link doesn't get that because that link is not in the nav section. But these two links are in the nav section, so they get that style rule. CSS, you know, it, it's like they say with CSS being a, uh, you know, like the game of chess. The game of chess, there's only a handful of rules of how the pieces move and what you can do and all that. And yet, chess is a very complicated game. Why? Because those rules can be combined in so many different ways. And CSS is the same way between the different selectors that you have and, uh, and all. Um, you can combine it many different ways. Um, to review what I did, because I, again, I didn't have the computer screen turned on, the nav A, I created a style to say all links in the nav section get a color of white. And then I put the background of the nav section to be my little tile and this is the end result. The navigation section has that background. The links are white. This link, because it's not in the background, or I'm sorry, because it's not in the nav section, does not get that for a background. All right. Other things that you can do that can be kind of fun is you can do a hover effect on links. All right. What do I mean by hover? You could do something like this. Nav A colon hover. That's a little bit different kind of selector. That's called a pseudo class. In other words, when you do this, when you hover on the link, that is when you have your mouse over on it, I could make the link yellow. So now, not sure if that's visible, but as I put my link over, my mouse over it, it becomes yellow. Or I could say, when I hover the link, make the background white, and make the color blue. We can do a little mouse over effect. We can also set styles for if the link's been visited or not. Um, and I think for one other state that I don't remember off the top of my head. That should be covered in the book. But 
can get a lot of uh, you know, functionality with this and just through the combination of selectors. I do apologize for not having the screen on. I will upload the example so you can see the final version. Yes? So Okay. Well, I'm not a hundred percent sure of what you mean. Uh, one thing you could do, for example, and again, do keep in mind that we're not, you know, that there's a lot of CSS that we're not covering. One thing you could do is you could put a border around your container. So I could say border. 10 pixel black solid and that would put a border around this. All right. Other thing I could do is if I wanted the body to be a different color, I could put um, on the body, I could put a background color of blue, let's say. Then we'd have that. Oh, that's not, that's not too swift. You could put a background image on the header, sure. You could put an image in the header as well. Yeah, yeah we'll leave it like that. That's not too bad. Well, that would be probably the header section. And the header section would, this is probably. Right. Right. So this would be, in fact, let's look and see. The image goes like this. The image is a transparent PNG. And this is a gradient that goes from darker tan to, to more of a white. Well, actually, it's probably bigger than 100% because if you notice, it goes past the width of the screen. Well, it does. So obviously, this doesn't use 100%. Maybe it uses, you know, 1,200 pixels as the width, and this monitor isn't big enough. You'd have to look at the code uh, to decide that. Um, other questions? All right. We'll see you up in lab.